I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up this evening. And um, I'm Kriya Bruner. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Humanities and Sciences. And this is the first of three virtual events where you have a chance to get to know the different stuff that we do and talk to both professors and students that we have in the programs. So a little bit about humanities and sciences. Um, we've got 22 different departments and 88 undergraduate degrees, 46 different minors that you guys could get into if you come here. Um, last year, the college awarded over $750,000 in scholarships to graduate and undergraduate students. Um, and 28 of our students have been Rhodes Scholars. So it's a pretty amazing group of students we've got here and it makes it an amazing place to work. Um, Regardless of what major you end up in, you can spend your first two years exploring all the different parts of what we have to offer in humanities and sciences. Um, I'll let you know the next virtual event, if you want to get back to the next one, is entitled Say More With Less, How Minimization Can Help You Find Beauty and Master the Universe. And that includes people from math and computer sciences. So tonight we have two professors and two students, one each from the history and anthropology departments. And they're gonna to talk to us about how each approach the study of the dead. So um, professors, we have Anya Jabor and Meredith Snow from history and anthropology. And then with students, we have Dylan Yance and Emily Owens from history and anthropology. And they're gonna talk for a while about what they do and how they study the dead. And then we have some time for the um, student advisors that advise all the students that we have. We have um, one from neurobiology and um, Rebecca Kranitz and Stephanie Trevi kind of heads all of advising. And they're both here to talk about what your education could look like while you're, you're at UM and answer questions that you guys might have. Um, and then we have, we have a program called the Student Ambassadors where it's undergraduates whose job it is to connect between the other, their peers and what's happening um, in the classes and with the professors and with the administration. And they're gonna come talk about their experiences and what life is like on campus. We'll have, we have Josh Hovis from admissions to answer any questions. And we'll actually have a question and answer session after each section. And when normally you would ask questions in a chat, this time there's, since it's a webinar, there's a Q&A button that you will go to to push to ask questions. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So if you are um, looking to what's happening next, we really encourage you guys to make an appointment to visit. I talk with a lot of students that come through um, my home departments in biology. And, uh, and it's exciting to talk to people about what we have to offer across the different groups. If um, you could then register for Bear Tracks and complete a housing application. So I hope you enjoy tonight. I'm psyched that you're here. And we now get to go to thinking about the study of the dead from with folks from history and anthropology. I'm gonna pass on to you guys, thanks. Thank you so much, Kriya. So um, my name is Anya Jabor and I'm a professor in the history department. And I'm really excited to be partnering with Dr. Meredith Snow and Emily Owens from anthropology, as well as with Dylan Yachts from history. Um, not only because Meredith and I have done this sort of thing together before, um, but also because we do both study dead people, but we study them in really different ways. Um, and uh, perhaps because we do both, well, basically study dead people, we have similar senses of humor. So be prepared <laughs> for that. So um, I'm gonna start off by asking Dr. Snow to tell everyone a little bit about the anthropology department and how it is that anthropologists go about digging up the dead before you know I take over and tell you how historians do it. Awesome, thank you Anya, that's lovely. And yeah, my name is Meredith Snow I'm from the anthropology department. I've been here for nearly a decade, uh, which is kind of mind blowing some days, um, but yeah, uh, there are several different aspects of anthropology. Um, you probably um, associate it with potentially those individuals like go live in the jungles with people. Um, that's what the people think of when they hear the term anthropology, but um, actually it's a much larger field than that um, that encompasses a whole bunch of different subfields. Uh, everything from studying um, basically all components of humans, so like language, or, which is our linguistics program here, um, and cultural anthropology, uh, which is individuals who you know study living individuals 
roles. Um, and then there's the archaeologists um, who also fall into anthropology. And so definitely lots of digging up the dead, like literally, um, for those individuals. And um, we're also going to have then the, the forensic anthropologists who are under biological anthropology, which is a little bit more of what I do. So um, that is kind of our four field approach, which is the typical way that anthropology programs are structured. We have a very large, robust program here with, with individuals representing each of the subfields as much as humanly possible. Um, and, and my research then is going to fall into that biological forensic anthropology area. Um, particularly, I study genetics. Um, and so I, I dig up the dead with um, basically looking at a, a lot of dead people um, <laughs> we're looking at their their genetics for a variety of different aspects um, primarily in the forensic realm so identifying bodies that we find um, I do that quite regularly with the state crime lab um, and then also uh, looking at the archaeological context and I work in Mexico um, doing doing work on migration and human population development um, and fluorescence in Mexico I could go on a lot about this, but I'm going to cut myself off there. So. <laughs> Me next. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Emily, tell us a little bit about um, the student group in the anthropology department. Yeah, so I'm Emily. I'm an undergrad in my senior year right now, and I'm president of the anthropology club which is called MASA and it stands for Montana Anthropology Student Association um, and we have monthly meetings and a whole bunch of items for the students to use so that they're comfortable in our department. We have a student lounge for students to have a quiet place to do homework and there's a computer in there that students use as well so that they don't have to pay the ridiculous amount of printing all the time. Um, and we also have a book loan for students. So if maybe there's a book that you don't necessarily wanna buy, we probably have it to loan out to you for the semester. Um, and we do all sorts of activities. Um, we're actually planning one where we do mock excavations, we do game nights, just to make sure that the students aren't driving themselves crazy and too focused and so that they have fun and it's usually anthropology related. We also have a club which I'm the treasurer of called Lambda Alpha. It's the um, Anthropology National Honor Society. So if you meet the qualifications, you can be part of that club too. And that's the more academic side of anthropology. They will help you with creating your CV and your cover letters. They will help you with um, writing papers. They'll send you in the right direction to the writing center. They do um, other activities that involve writing competitions. They'll help you with conference posters. Um, there, there's just so many opportunities in the anthropology department and we're all here to help you um, together. So, and we, we try to be as open as possible and everybody from each subfield of anthropology does come into these groups. And we have a lot of fun um, seeing how we interact with each other. And it's just an overall very friendly experience. We all get along with the professors. It's really fun being in the anthropology department at UA. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Um, Anya, tell us a little bit about how you go about digging up the dead. <laughs> sure. So um, as Meredith just reminded me, of course, there are anthropologists who deal do deal with the living, um, but her work in her incredibly cool lab um, is literally digging up the dead and like somehow extracting DNA from the bones and uh, learning cool stuff that way. And I'm not gonna say more about that because um, that, that's her field. Um, but the way historians typically dig up the dead um, is a little bit less literal in that we usually study the dead through the writings and the objects that they have left behind. Um, historians tend to be better with the writings and archeologists tend to specialize in the objects, but there is some overlap there. And in fact, there's a lot of great overlap between history and anthropology, especially archaeology at U of M. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a historic preservation certificate 
which is under the anthropology department, but which also has history classes. And then there's a public history certificate, which is under the history department, but which also has anthropology classes. Um, so we, we, we play well, <laughs> we play well together. Um, and a lot of our students end up um, doing, some, doing some crossover um, in that way. So um, the history department is a little different from the anthropology department in that we don't have so such a variety of um, fields um, in terms of like totally different approaches. Our fields tend to be divided up either um, geographically by the part of the world or chronologically by the time period. But our students, um, although they may choose to specialize in either a chronological time period or a geographical area, um, they are not required to do that. Um, and we usually encourage them to really explore so that they get to know as many faculty members as possible um, and then figure out who they really click with and then do more of the specialization. But there's not a formal track for any of those specializations. Um, the formal uh, kind of specializations that we do have is that in addition to the regular history major, we have a history teaching major which we offer in conjunction with the School of Education and that that prepares you to teach um, to teach junior high or high school history classes in the state of Montana. And then we also have a public history track, um, which is a 12 credit certificate within the history department, although you can complete it even if you're not a history major. And that's the kind of part of our program. Uh, it's the newest part of our program actually. Uh, but it's the kind of the hands-on history part of our program. Um, it's the part where you might actually end up on an archaeology dig, <laughs> um, because that's one of the things that you could do for a public history internship. That is actually one of the options. Um, but our public history track students um, usually complete internships. Dylan can tell you about her roommate, Clara's really super cool internship um, with the Missoula Treasurer's Office. Um, but we also have classes where the entire class does a class project. So one of the most exciting ones that we have going on right now is documenting COVID-19 in real time. So we train students to conduct interviews uh, with people about their experiences during the pandemic. We started doing this back in May and we're still doing it now. So trying to record the entirety of the pandemic so that future generations, when they're curious about what it was like to live through this <laughs> remarkable time period, uh, will actually have um, something to go on. So I think I also could go on forever, but I also am going to cut myself off um, so that you get a chance to hear from Dylan, uh, who, um, who is in our public history track um, and is also involved, very involved as the student leadership team for our history society. And she can tell you more about the student side of things. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Dylan. Like Dr. DuBoer said, I'm a sophomore. I'm studying history and I have certificates in public history and migration studies. And then I am also minoring in geography. Um, I only say that because I think it's really important to mention that history can be so interdisciplinary um, so easily. And there's so much that you can incorporate into it. Um, in addition to that, uh, I'm from Missoula and I'm studying history here just because I think that we're living in a time when our, our past is a important to study, yes, to dig up the dead and, and look at that. But also I think that it's really important that we make those connections to the future and how we can you know, make our world a better place. And that's kind of where my migration studies focus is. Um, uh, I guess, for the History Society, we do a lot of outreach between students and professors. So we have like coffee and profs or pizza with profs where you can go and interact with professors. And personally, that's been really nice for me because my focus is pretty much 20th century European history um, for the most part, but I've had an opportunity to um, talk to and work with professors like uh, Professor Jabor, who I haven't actually taken a classroom yet, will do though, um, as well as um, uh, different professors in, in religious history and ancient history that I uh, wouldn't otherwise interact with as much, which has been really nice. Um, in terms of like my student experience in particular, I think 
um, this year, at least one of the my favorite things that we're doing and also ties into the public history certificate is I'm taking um, an alcohol and American history class. It's an upper division history course with a public history component. Um, so I just wrote a research paper about uh, where I went through and read a bunch of months of the Journal of the American Temperance Union um, and wrote about just, yeah, how temperance interacted with um, 19th century America before prohibition. And that was super interesting. Um, and then we will be conducting interviews in the next month of school with people who are somehow involved in anything alcohol in the Missoula community, whether they be a business owner or something, or, or a regular at, you know, Plonk or whatever, I'll be talking to them about um, how COVID has impacted their business or their consumption or, you know, a variety of questions that I'll build based on who I choose. And then all of that information will go into the archives for future students. Um, and yeah, I guess the last thing I'll say is that um, I'm also going to be doing uh, an internship working in the special collections and archives this summer for part of my public history thing uh, for certificate. And I guess um, one of the best parts about that is that um, in the history department here, I've been able to cultivate and work on such excellent relationships with my professors that you know, they knew I'm part of the certificate program and that I needed an internship. And so Dr. Jabor and, and Dr. Volk reached out personally to me to um, link me up with that internship. And so I think the connections that I've made in the department with faculty and, and my fellow students have been super important. And I love studying history at the U. Okay. I think this is one of those times that we open up for Q&A. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody's saying, yes, that's right. <laughs> but I'm not sure who's in charge of asking, of telling us what the questions are. Yeah. I'll get those, just a second. We wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without this. I did want to quickly jump in because actually there's another crossover thing between history and uh, the anthropology department. And that is that there's actually a couple of digs going on in downtown Missoula, um, which are really fun and kind of dealing with Missoula's kind of interesting, fascinating, little weird sort of at times history. Um, so this has um, been an ongoing project that kind of evolved from something that originally happened a few um, well, actually, it's been closer to a decade ago now that I realized it happened before I got here. Um, but uh, discovering some of the tunnels that would run underneath actually downtown um, Missoula and doing some tours and some excavations of those really neat historical um, uh, features basically and then actually um, the last couple of summers and I believe this will be continuing for a while um, there's been excavations archaeological excavations of some of the historic regions of downtown Missoula um, right now they're working at at the Cranky Sam's um, and, um, and that's been really really interesting um, recognizing some of the Chinese history in Missoula and also some other uh, red light district stuff, which has been fascinating um, and really interesting for me to learn about from my colleagues working there. Um, but, you know, kind of that historic period that, that bleeds over between the two periods uh, or the two fields here. So lots of fun. Yes. And with that, there's actually a historical archaeology subfield that kind of blends in with everything. And that's those are the people who have been mainly working on the downtown project. Yeah, so Dr. Kelly Dixon um, and her graduate student, Nikki, uh, are wonderful humans and teach a lot of classes on historical archaeology that allows for that. Uh, Kelly Dixon also works on the Donner or worked on the Donner Party, which, um, you know, kind of a fun, fascinating <laughs> account as well. Um, something I always like to think about when I, when I think about her. She's, she's wonderful. So, yeah. I'm glad so, you brought that up, Meredith. And this actually ties in with a question I can see that someone's asking about opportunities for interdisciplinary majors. So there's a company in town called Historical Research Associates that actually uh, employs both archeologists and other anthropologists and historians. Um, there's kind of two different wings. The historians tend to do research that um, is often uh, in aid of some kind of um, 
uh, legal issue like the Department of Justice um, trying to figure out reparations to tribes or the, um, the EPA trying to figure out who exactly was responsible for environmental damage and is responsible for paying for that environmental uh, uh, reparations, right, that kind of thing. And then on the other side, the anthropology folks um, are the ones who do cultural resource management. And as it's been explained to me, they kind of camp out wherever something is going to be developed to make sure that nobody accidentally destroys an important um, artifact or feature. And I'm sure Meredith is laughing at my simplistic way <laughs> of explaining this. Um, but but, um, but that's a, a really interesting example of where the crossover between histo history and anthro actually continues in our local businesses here in town. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a great deal there. And actually cultural resource management is, all, is one of the big um, areas within archeology. span We have um, a lot of uh, classes geared towards that. It is one of the biggest areas that employs archeologists. Um, and yeah, you're, you're totally right there. Like it's, it's when something is going to be built, a road's expanded, a new building is gonna go in. Anytime the dirt's gonna be disturbed, you have to have it um, surveyed for any sort of damage that might occur to um, any anything really historic or prehistoric um so there's uh, lots of things there i actually worked as a coastal resource management archaeologist for a couple years before starting graduate school um so it's it's a great field um, and there's a lot of opportunity and, and a lot of our graduates actually go into that um is, there's just a lot of, of jobs available um and uh it's it's a fun field actually uh, if you if you like to be a shovel bomb is what they refer to them. <laughs> so um but, yeah um, there's a question in the chat um, for undergrads about um, what they do for fun in Missoula or what their favorite parts of it are. Yeah, I can I can start off with this one. I was born and raised in Missoula, and so I actually grew up one block off of campus and then moved one block onto campus my freshman year of college. So I know all about Missoula. Um, I guess my favorite part of Missoula is the relationship between the community and the natural surroundings. I spend a lot of time hiking, backpacking, skiing, and I can walk two minutes from my house and do a six mile hike, or I can drive 10 minutes and backpack all the way to Sealy Lake if I want to, um, which is really awesome. I also think that just the Missoula community um, in terms of the university, like we really like help each other and take care of each other. I really like how much university students interact with the rest of the community. Um, and I guess in terms of what I like to do for fun in town, it's kind of hard to remember pre pandemic times, but, um, you know, we have like a lot of really good like bars and restaurants downtown. We have a lot of opportunities on campus to do things like, you know, they'll do, they'll screen movies on the oval. Um, there's an ice skating rink on the oval right now. Um, I just like to, you know, like have friends over or whatever and go walk around. I'd say, yeah, Missoula is just a really beautiful place to interact with the outdoors. And a lot of the students that go to the university like to do that. Um, and so it's really nice to, to get to do that with my friends, no matter what the season is. I don't know if y'all have more specific questions, let me know. But um, yeah, anything outdoors is great. Yeah, I, I agree. I've only been here about two years so, and I'm still exploring the town. Um, but I, I, I do think that Missoula is a very nice town in terms of community. And, you know, it's also my personal thing is it's not that big either. I, I don't like huge towns. And I, I just think it's a very friendly place filled with lots of opportunities. And I think that is great, especially when looking for a university that's really important to me. Yeah, and there's, there's one last question if you guys don't mind I'm stepping up for one last one. Um, thanks undergrads for, for being here. Um, is, you know, how is your time at UM preparing you for the future, for what you might wanna do next? Yeah, so like I said, I'm a senior, so I'm going to go on to my master's in um, 
osteoarchaeology in Scotland pretty soon. Um, and I like with the anthropology department, they've helped me the whole way through whenever I had questions and they were so helpful and they kept me on the right track. Um, so my, my future is still pretty educational compared to some of those who just get their, their bachelors and go out into the world. Um, but what's your future like, Dylan? Thanks. Yeah. What about you, Dylan? Yeah, um, so I knew when I came to the university that I wanted to study history. I came in declared that way, but I also had no idea what I wanted to do with it. I just was like, oh, I love I love history so much. It's always been my favorite subject. I love to write, so this is what I'm going for. Um, I uh, think that in terms of preparation for the future, I'm like Emily in the fact that I will probably continue my education past my undergrad um, with a master's, but I just have realized that there are so many different facets of the workforce that history majors can go into that I didn't even know were things. Like you don't just have to like be a professor. You Like if you want to continue to go to school and you want to teach history, like that's great and incredible, but there are a ton of different jobs in, in government and in the private sector that are in need of historians. Um, and I think that too, like our world right now is in need of more historians um, and people who have a, a broad understanding of history and its implications. Um, yeah, I guess I have like really narrowed my focus since I got here compared to what I was planning on doing, but you know, internships like my one in the archives this summer, um, studying abroad in Wales next year and scholarships through the history department and the honors college are um, allowing me to do that. And I'm studying like Asian migration in World War II and um, like identity in place while I'm there. And I get to actually study the stuff in Wales instead of studying stuff about Europe from the United States. And so I think that the university has provided me a lot of opportunities to explore um, future fields and, and just what I want to do. And I think the possibilities are endless, so. That's so awesome. I, I love your guys' stories too. Um, and yeah, there's there's a ton more. <laughs> uh, almost every student has an excellent uh, story behind their experiences here. So, um, and now it's actually time to turn this over to Rebecca, Rebecca Kranitz if you wanted to jump in here and um, do some more Q and A. Speak. I'm not sure. Um. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca and Stephanie Retrievi are the undergrad advisors, and they're going to tell us about a little bit about the advising program and how things work, and then there'll be time for questions. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Great. Well, thank you for having us. Um, we'll just start with brief introductions, and then I'll turn it over to Steph to talk a bit about the HNS Advising Center. Uh, but my name is Rebecca Kranitz. I am the academic advisor for neuroscience, medical laboratory science, geoscience, and then some psychology students with last names A through E. And I've been with the Advising Center since August of 2019. Um, and it's been a really great experience working for UM because I am a UM alumni. I did not come here for undergraduate, but I did come here for graduate school. And um, I got my MS in geography and crazy turn of events have now decided to return to graduate school at UM. Um, and now I'll work towards a master's in education um, while still advising on the side. So it's really nice to be involved in so many different areas and I get to work with students every day, which I think is the best part. Um, but now I'll turn it over to Steph and we'll talk a little bit more about what we do in the advising center. Yes. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm Steph Retrievi and director of the Director of Student Services for the College of Humanities and Sciences. A big part of that is um, directing the Academic Advising Center, but I also advise our physics students in our uh, new multidisciplinary studies uh, major. So um, when we think about how many different connections can be drawn between academic units, uh, we brought on a brand new major that allows students to, if they choose, kind of build their own. Um, 
So it's an exciting new major and it's great fun working with the folks who are going that route. But to tell you a little bit about the Academic um, Advising Center and what you can expect is your professional advisor is someone who really partners with you in your academic journey. So uh, when we know that when you come to college, you're gonna make a you're gonna make a lot of decisions. There's many, many choices of majors. Our majors are built in such a way that it's very easy as we've heard from Emily and Dylan to add on a minor or a certificate. There's so many different unique ways that you can shape and enrich your academic life that um, it, it takes work, it takes some planning, but you have a partner in that and that's your academic advisor. What we do is in our work with students, we make sure that you have relevant information, you have pertinent, up-to-date information, and then you've got someone to talk through um, as you are making decisions and, and assessing your options and looking at the information that is in front of you. So whether things are going swimmingly or you've hit a little bump in the road, your academic advisor is someone that you can turn to. Um, our advisors know about the curriculum. So they know about the flow of their majors. They know about course sequences. They kind of know, okay, this is what you're aiming for to stay on track based on your uh, preference, your timetable to graduation. And then they also know cool things. And in just about every academic advising conversation, as I talk with my team, they're bringing up things, uh, they're bringing things to the table in their conversations with students to get them to think beyond um, their own plans. And that might be a study abroad. It might be, when are you working on or planning to do undergraduate research? And who should I be, who are the faculty that I should be talking to if I wanna do undergraduate research? And when do I get that, that whole ball rolling? Or maybe you wanna stay in the US, but you wanna study at a different school for a semester. You can tap into national student exchange. So there's all these kinds of cool things that you have in front of you, a myriad of ways that you can put your academic work together and your professional advisor, again, is someone that can help you see your options, assess your options, and work with you to put your plans into action. Uh, what you can expect as an admitted student is your academic advisor is one of the first persons that you will work with. That will be, um, well, you'll work extensively with your advisor when you build your first semester schedule. So if you're starting here in the fall, it will just be within a couple of weeks. You'll be meeting with that person on an individual basis and doing that work of putting that um, course schedule together. We meet with students at least once a semester, but appointments are student driven. So depending on the relationship, the things that you like to talk through with an advisor, you may be um, working with your advisor even more often than once a semester. And, and that's just a joy to us. So um, if there's one thing that I hope you take from this conversation is your academic journey will be work, planning, but you don't need to do it alone. You'll have someone who is your partner in your academic journey. Rebecca, what would you like to add to that? Well, I think to just go off that last point you made is that, um, you know, as our panelists earlier indicated how interdisciplinary our programs are in humanities and sciences, sometimes advising, you might end up working with a couple of advisors, say if you are a double major or minoring and majoring in some field within humanities and sciences. And one thing that I enjoy the most about this job is being able to work with my colleagues so closely. And so we're a really tight knit team. And so I really see the advising center as a really strong community that you'll be welcomed into as soon as you 
start your classes at UM. Um, and so because of that, we are able to answer questions you might have about a different program that you're interested in or a different major within HNS. With there's so much room to explore within this college. Um, and as, as Steph mentioned earlier, like how often do you meet with your advisor? Well, mostly one, once a semester to get that registration pin, get your courses planned, talk, catch up. I love catching up with my students, so I'll have plenty of questions um, just to see how things are going for you. But um, we're really flexible with the types of appointments we offer. And so we have um, appointment scheduling, which is really straightforward to do online. You can pick your preferred time from our availability and schedule really simply. We also offer drop-in advising. So say you have a quick question and you don't feel like you need to schedule a full appointment. Um, we have drop-in advising with all the advisors spread throughout the entire week. Um, and then when it comes to how we connect with students, it's been a bit different this year with COVID. And so most of us are doing virtual appointments um, but we can also do phone calls, like say your internet connection isn't that strong, you can't get into Zoom, there is still plenty of ways that we can connect with you. So I don't want you to feel like there's any barriers in that regard. We'll, we'll find a way to get you the answers you need. Um, and so I'm seeing some questions come in from our audience. So I'll start. Um, and Steph, you mentioned this a little, but we'll go into this in a bit more detail. What is one experience that you recommend every student seeks out during their time in college? I know you talked about undergraduate research a bit, but is there anything else you might want to add to that? I would say one of those academic enriching experiences. And so that can be, that I think is really student dependent. So whether that is research, an internship, study abroad, or national student exchange, or a service learning project that is an extensive service learning project. It's a smorgasbord there, but one of those that really fits the academic and personal goals of the students the student is what I hope every undergraduate does, has. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. And we, um, separate from the College of Humanities and Sciences, just more of an overall campus resource, we have something called the Experiential Learning and Career Success Office. And um, we have a team of career coaches that can help you identify these out of classroom experiences that you might want to take advantage of. Um, like internships, volunteer opportunities, or even some paid jobs either in the summer or maybe over winter break. Um, and so there's a really great team of mentors on campus to help connect you with these various opportunities. Um, so I'm seeing a couple other questions we'll move on to, but this one's directed to our students. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Dylan if she's willing to answer this one, but I'm wondering if you can share a little bit on student perspective and professional advising. So what have you found to be beneficial from this service that we're able to offer you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that advising programs are great. I wanted to speak more generally about just like advising um, as a whole at the university. I think like it's really important that prospective students know that advisors and professors want to see you succeed and that they want to talk to you about these kind of things. I like, I don't know, I know that a lot of students, myself included, when I first started at the U, was nervous about reaching out to people about things. And, and like, you know, on your student email, you'll get emails about advising things or different opportunities. Um, but I think that it's really important just to know that that advisors and professors want to talk to you about courses. They want to talk to you about professional opportunities and internships, and they're there to help you every step of the way. And that's something that you should totally, totally do on a regular basis. I know that I email with professors and advisors all the time, and it's great to, to build those connections in the department and in the Honors College as well. And it's just, um, it's not scary. You should do it. It's fun. It's good. 
Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Dylan. And, and I think something we experienced with a lot of freshman students or new students in general is it might be a little intimidating to reach out to a professor for help. It like might feel a little shy or discouraged if you're not doing well in a class. And that's another area that we can really help with. I know I've had plenty of students where I'll we'll schedule an appointment and I'll help them write that email to their professor. So I could give advice. This is what you should say and how you should say it so that you it, it makes that scary process a bit easier for you. And so we're all more than happy to help connect you with faculty. And even if you're not having a problem in a class, maybe you want to just reach out to a professor and start to talk about research and see if there's any space in their lab to get you started with some research opportunities. Um, we could always help connect you in that capacity as well. Okay, so seeing more questions. This is so great. Um, so what advice do you have for excelling in classes? I um, mean, this can be open to advisors and students if you want to jump in. But I think, Steph, do you have anything or any answers for that one? I, I have some ideas if you don't. Yes. So a couple of uh, uh, good study habits are to and these are tips, is to um, find a place and a time where you tend to work well, where your body tells you this is the place that I study. It gets you in the kind of emotional frame of mind that I have a job to do when I'm in this spot and that um, I have come to this spot and we'll take care of my business now. I'll let, I'll let someone else jump in with a tip and let's just see if we can brainstorm four or five good ones. Well, Steph, that's a, a great idea. And it's something I learned about myself as an undergrad and I never knew this before, but turns out I'm a morning person. Um, I used to think I was a night owl, but it turns out I do my best studying first thing in the morning and that, that took some trial and error but once I identified that it made things a lot smoother for me. Um, so you know you some classes you might really thrive in they might come really easily and other classes might give you some problems and that's um, there's always different ways to address any issue that you're having. Um, something that I like to suggest is tutoring and we have study jam on campus and it's our tutoring service that is free to students um, we've been doing it in zoom for the most part this past year but we'll hope to transition back into our normal tutoring sessions which take place on campus through tutoring you get to work one-on-one -on -one with our student tutors who've taken these classes before and most of them are hand-picked by the professors to tutor in study jam, um, but also might be a great chance to meet new people and connect with other people on campus. Um, but I think overall, one of the most important things you can do is know when you need to reach out for help. And um, don't, if you think you're struggling, if you think you need advice, don't hesitate to reach out to advisors, to faculty, you can go to office hours with faculty. Some of your classes might have teaching assistants that also office or also offer office hours. That was a hard one to say. Um, but really, as, as long as you're able to first identify that you need help, then that's going to guarantee that we can at least connect you with those resources to get you back on track. Um, and so now let's hear from some of our students. Ah. I heard something in the back. Hi, my name's Cassie. Um, one of the ways that I have found to be so beneficial for excelling in my classes is keeping a very comprehensive schedule tracking system. I, at the beginning of every semester, I print out all my syllabi and I write down on my calendar when all of the assignments are due. And if there are things that aren't contained in the syllabus that a professor talks about, like a due date during class, I'll write that down right away. And I make sure that I can rely on my calendar to show me when everything is due so nothing slips through the cracks. 
Um, I'd also highly recommend going to your professor's office hours at the beginning of the semester, go in just to introduce yourself and develop a rapport with that professor um, because you never know that that could end up being a strong advocate for you when it comes to scholarships and jobs and whatnot. Um, but also um, just like develop a rapport with them so that you feel comfortable going in and asking questions and clarifying assignments to make sure that you're on the right track with everything. Um, another thing I would recommend if you are going into an area of study that requires a lot of essay writing is to get in the habit of like when you have a prompt, especially a, a lengthy prompt, to break it down into every single question that is being asked in the prompt and then make sure you answer every single one of them because that's how the professor is going to be grading you to make sure that you've actually answered everything. So I always, whenever I have a prompt for a project or an essay or paper, um, I'll break it down into the most basic components to make sure I've ticked every box and I can get as close to 100 as I can. <laughs> great. Thanks, Cassie. That's great advice. And Dylan, let's hear what you have to add on. Yeah, um, I think that my so my major is super reading and writing heavy, um, which I love. It's the best part of my major. I love it so much. But anyways, um, I think that what has worked best for me is, you know, I'll, I'll echo what Rebecca and Cassie said, like making sure that you develop a good schedule and you know what times of day work best for you and what works best for you. But um, especially this year with the pandemic, something that's really helped me focus and navigate Zoom land is um, planning my days based around like my computer time versus my not computer time. And then also finding ways to study with my peers um, like in a safe way. I think um, there's about six of us who have the same two hour break between classes on Monday and Wednesday. And so we get together masked up and we work on assignments together. We proofread each other's stuff. And it's also just a way to like let your brain decompress from being on your computer a lot. And I know that things will be different in the fall than they are currently in this ever changing um, series of months. But uh, as they were very different at this time last year, but I think that yeah, um, the more that you communicate with your peers in your classes and like make friends um, and form study groups and stuff like that. And then the more you communicate with your professors, the easier it is to excel in class because not only do you have your own personal whatever drive or motivation for your classes, but you also have the drive and motivation of everyone around you. Um, and having that support is really nice. and. And then it's fun to like all celebrate together and be excited when everyone submits their paper or everything gets done or the semester ends successfully for you. So I think um, as hard as it can be this year, the community aspect of college has really helped me to excel in my academics as well as my social life as well. So I love that. This is all such great advice. Um, and it's really nice to hear advisor perspectives, student perspectives, and now what I think I'm most excited for is to hear professor perspectives on how to excel in classes. So let's hear from Professor Jabour. Well, I, I mean, I don't know how much I can add um, to what Dylan and Cassie both said, except that why, why aren't you in my classes? <laughs> I need you both in my classes. Um, those are such, uh, I mean, those are really wonderful tips. Um, I think I would just reiterate because I, I don't, I think this is that a lot of people are really afraid of coming to office hours and think that professors are ooh, scary. And um, hopefully um, you, I can, you know, convey to you that Honestly, um, I mean, I love nothing better than talking with students about how things are going and helping them to problem solve. And it's one of my, I mean, that's, that's one of the things I really love about teaching. And I've been doing this for 25, 26 <laughs> years now. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's really the thing that keeps me going and keeps me energized. So um, you should always like, feel free to stop by your, professor's office hours, but if their office hours don't work for you, you should email them or stop by after class when this is actually possible again and ask to make an appointment. Um, and then you can get one-on-one -on -one time and not, and not uh, you know, 
have to miss another obligation in order to do office hours. And then the other thing, the other resource that I don't think anyone's mentioned yet is that we have something called the Writing and Public Speaking Center on campus. And uh, it's people who are tutors who specifically focus on writing and public speaking as the name might suggest. And many of my students have found that the that the writing tutors have been really helpful to them because of course history is a very writing heavy <laughs> discipline and sometimes making the jump from writing for your high school history class to writing for college history can be a pretty big jump um, and they can also really help and give you one on one uh, feedback so yeah um, that's what I that's what I had to add but honestly I, I kind of think the others um covered covered uh this from the student perspective better than i can great this is all such great advice and um i really have to second the, the writing and public speaking center um i went there i had a standing appointment bi-weekly appointment when i was in grad school and just went had it scheduled from the start of the semester so i could easily fit it into my daily plans and got such great feedback and i still use the writing center um, now that I'm back in school again. Um, and so I, I don't see no, no matter how far along you get in your undergraduate or graduate studies, there's these resources on campus that are always going to help you grow and learn new skills. And so I think that was such a great conversation. To, so thanks everyone for your contributions. Uh, but now I'd like to move on to our next set of panelists, our student ambassadors. So we have Jenny Taylor and Cassie Williams here serving as two of our student ambassadors. Um, and just a little bit on the ambassador program. Um, we have 11 current student ambassadors that work with the College of Humanities and Sciences in many different areas. We, one, develop some social media content. We work on connecting students with different campus resources um, and different opportunities on campus. And we also help with some student outreach to make sure that our students are aware of the different events that they can participate in in the college. Um, and so Jenny and Cassie are going to talk a bit about why they chose to come to UM and some of their favorite aspects of what UM and Missoula can offer. All right, I can go first. So my name is Cassie and I am from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I am a senior here at the university studying political science. Um, one of the main reasons I chose to come to UM is due to the beautiful campus. It's covered in plants and trees and gardens and um, actually is Montana's uh, dedicated state arboretum, fun fact of the day. and. Uh, one of the big drawing points of the campus is what's called the oval, which is this giant um, field area out front and during the spring and summer people will go out there and play frisbee or lay out a blanket and study and it's just really beautiful. Also, the University Center, which is like a student union building, is filled with amazing humongous greenery. It's so cool. You got to check it out. Um, but some of my favorite things um, since I've been here at University of Montana uh, have been the interdisciplinary majors. So I'm studying political science, but I've found that there's actually been flexibility with fulfilling my major requirements. And so um, there have been options to take, say, a history course or an economics course to satisfy a political science requirement because these are majors that do overlap in the real world. Um, I've also had the opportunity to take graduate level classes um, to satisfy my political science requirements and that's really cool because they're super small class sizes like I'm in a class of 10 right now and you get to interact with grad students which I've really appreciated. Um, there's also other opportunities to supplement your major with the myriad of minors and certificates here. Uh, like I'm taking a nonprofit administration minor along with my major. And there's just so many options that cross a variety of disciplines and allow you to get a more well-rounded education. Um, and the classes here offer 
different types of experiences like research in the state of the art laboratories, field work, experiential and service learning, which is all really cool. Um, and I know one of the big concerns when going to school is the cost. And so UM has made this really helpful tool called the scholarship portal, which allows you to basically fill out an application for all of the scholarships at once, which is so helpful and relieves a lot of stress. So you basically just answer a bunch of questions, write, write a few blurbs, you know, attach a letter of recommendation, and then all your scholarship applications are pretty much done. Um, I think the last thing that I wanted to touch on is the Associated Students of the University of Montana or ASUM. Um, ASUM has a ton of student groups and clubs for you to get involved outside of class. They have a group for pretty much everything from gardening to a circus club. There's a, there's a crafting club, a fashion club, groups for recreating and fishing and just everything. And also you can get involved with student government as a senator, a student at large, or some other leadership role. Or, or become a student ambassador. And I'll pass it on to Jenny. Thanks, Cassie. Yeah, that was great. I totally agree with everything that Cassie had brought up, all the groups. It really amazes you on, um, on when you first come here, because we do on the Oval with all the clubs and there's just, it's so full of student groups and all the different opportunities there are to get involved on campus. So my name is Jenny and as was mentioned, I am also one of the student ambassadors for the College of Humanities and Sciences. I'm from a small town here in Montana called Wolf Creek and I'm here studying neuroscience. I originally chose Montana because I kind of wanted a little bit of a change of pace. It's a bigger city for me and a new environment. I also recently learned that our campus is the State Arboretum, which totally explains why we have so many different kinds of trees everywhere. And it's just so beautiful all the time. It's always so green. They take really good care of the campus and make it a really wonderful place to be. Um, I've always loved visiting Missoula because of how beautiful it is and all the outdoor opportunities, which we have great programs here on campus. Our recre recreation center has a bunch of programs for students to explore the outdoors. I rented paddle boards from them and I was able to go up and paddle board on Holland Lake and then go hiking. They, I also took a climbing class here last spring and I've really enjoyed being able to continue that at the climbing wall on campus. They also have a lot of other classes like yoga and martial arts. Um, a lot of the classes there are like on campus are really small so that really helps to personalize learning which is really helpful for me, especially coming from a smaller school when I came here. Um, I lived in the dorms when I came here and it was a great way to start making friends. I know the dorms can be kind of a scary situation at first, but it was really cool because I, I was able to talk to a lot of the other incoming freshmen and pick who I wanted to um, room with. So my roommate ended up being a really good friend of mine and we even lived together once we moved off campus for a little bit. Food Zoo was also a big part of my life because I like my food. It's a really great place to go and meet up with friends and hang out. Sometimes I would spend most of the afternoon there. It was really unique also because it was accommodating to all dietary restrictions. They always brought in a lot of unique food options. They would also do a lot of themed nights with games and karaoke. Um, a lot of the food from the food zoo is also locally sourced, which is pretty common throughout Missoula and the campus, so I'm all about that. Another thing that really stands out to me about UM is the opportunities to get involved. I've been able to be a part of many aspects of the neuroscience program. I helped start our neuroscience club, which helped me connect with other students in the major. I've also written some stories for our program webpage. I've also branched out to other programs and clubs. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm in a program called Grizz Health, and I'm also an instructor for our swing dancing club here on campus. Um, there really does seem to be a club for everything, and that's just, I think that makes us even more unique. Uh, so I also agree that there's a lot of opportunity to build relationships with professors and advisors. Rebecca is my advisor, and we 
I feel like I am emailing her every other week, just either wanting to catch up or <laughs> just talk about what's going on in my classes. So they, they are really helpful in your whole college experience. They can really help you connect with a lot of different aspects of the college and help support you. Like was mentioned earlier, the university has free programs for tutoring. They have Study Jam, the Math Learning Center, and the Writing Center. Those have definitely saved my life through some of the classes that I've taken. So yeah, I've just really found that the university is a really welcoming place and everyone here really does wanna help you succeed. And to me, that support has been especially crucial and helpful throughout this last year. Great, you touched on so many incredible points about this campus. Um, one thing I know we mentioned recreation, but one last thing I want to point out about campus, which I thought was one of the coolest things, um, because I'm a skier. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Montana mostly came here for the opportunity to study in the geography department. But you can see Snowball, our local ski hill, from campus. And I just think that's so cool because it really shows how Missoula is positioned, just surrounded by every recreation opportunity you can think of. Um, and that's on top of everything else that we offer on campus. So um, I think it's a really incredible place to be. Um, but I think we, we've made it through our panelists. Um, and I'm looking in our Q&A to see if there are any additional questions, but it looks like they have been answered. So I'll leave it for a couple of minutes to see if anyone else has other questions or other comments that any of our panelists would like to share uh, before we wrap up for the night. And we can also pass on to Josh um, if he wants to talk about admissions at all. Yes, we can do that. Josh, are you? We gotta wait for his camera to get turned on. Exactly. In the meantime, if anyone has any other questions, we'd be, oh, yeah, we need to get camera, his access to camera. Um, any other questions that anyone has? We'd be happy to um, answer, tell you about stuff that's happening here. Thanks you guys for, oh, there's Josh now. Yeah. Passing yeah, up. Yeah, Josh from Missions. Just wanna let everybody know we're open for campus visits. So if you can visit us in campus, if you're over there and Washington and you want to make the drive over, or we do virtual visits as well. So if you want a virtual visit, a counselor or a student advocate will walk you around campus, show you what you're missing out on by not being here, and then we can see you this summer. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat. Absolutely. Thanks, you guys, for um, being with us and asking us questions about what's happening in the college and learning about what can happen with dead bodies. And uh, we'll give you guys a second to see if there are any other questions, anything comes up. But um, if not, really encourage you to come visit campus. It's a beautiful place. And the just the feeling on campus, it's really welcoming. And the college is an amazing place to come. Tons of different things happening. So I hope we see you and be in touch. Anything else, folks? Nope, already. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.